La, okay. la, la. Well and Action. take one. <laughs> take one. Here we go. So um, you, we've uh, talked a lot about writing code. Uh, when you start writing code, you always start with an empty file, and then you write, and then you. Hand a blank page. And you hand it into the faculty member and they say, oh, congratulations, you did a little thing. In this course, we've really been focusing on here's a big thing uh, and it's not necessarily perfect. Uh, a lot of the code that you wrote was written really fast and you guys. That are, Bilbo, that Bilbo Buggins. <laughs> and, uh, and the joy on, on your faces when you found the bugs and uh, brought them up <laughs> in classes was fantastic. Yes. Um, so we talked about this at the beginning of the class. Uh, you know, we have uh, these numbers are, are kind of um, about right. It's 35% uh, of your coding time, which is 50% of your time is spent just reading code. 10% yeah. uh, is debugging and stuff like that. And only 5% of your time is actually writing code. But don't they measure like how many lines of code you produce a day? They do, but it's it's It's, it's that little. It's that little, yeah. Oh, wow. The, the, yeah. Uh, it, it, at Amazon, we did an annual uh, survey of programmers, yeah. and if if people were spending 15 hours a week programming, they were really happy. Wow! Out of 40. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we've got this uh, GitHub Copilot here. Oh, uh, yes. But the, the I don't know. We've all played with Copilot. It sometimes it puts a lot of crap in there that you don't need, yeah. which is good and not bad, but you have to be careful with it. Then you have to read more code, you know, yeah. like that's pretty good, I think, yeah. actually. Um, so uh, software engineering and machine learning, uh, these are kind of some of the, the Google searches uh, that we're seeing for this. And uh, the red one is uh, the machine learning uh, questions. And then the blue one is software engineering. Uh, but you're seeing that there's a lot of, uh, there's an uptake in software engineering uh, as machine learning continues to just be a little bit flat. Yeah, I don't know. What was the end of the year there? Because I feel like machine learning is definitely. Oh, this is year? two years ago. Two years ago. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, I love uh, software engineering, so I love that outcome. Yeah. I'm just curious what it is now. So what we want to talk about today is very quickly just remind you of all the stuff we've talked about refactoring. Uh, you've seen the refactoring as we've refactored calc sheet several times for you yeah. to hand it out. Um, and you know, how do you refactor this? How does it fit in Agile? Uh, we want to talk about tactical debt. Uh, you'll hear a lot of people talk about tactical debt. What exactly is tactical debt? We'll get to it because it really is an amorphous, almost meaningless term. Yeah, I feel like it became popular several years ago when we started to think about uh, things, trying to measure cognitive burdens and things like that in software engineers. And uh, yeah, I don't know. And and I guess it is tightly tied to Agile. Mm, not necessarily. You could have a, a long-term project that has a lot of technical debt. <laughs> if you believe in the term technical, technical debt. debt exactly. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so refactoring. Uh, refactoring is the process of making your code better. That's it. That's yeah. all there is to it. Uh, it's uh, you write code fast, uh, and then you look at it, and you go, oh, that class shouldn't be there, or that particular functionality shouldn't be there. I want to move it over there. Yeah. It's an ongoing thing that you do uh, as your software grows. Yeah, and I think I heard uh, our guest, Jeff, uh, talk a little bit in passing about just getting rid of bad smells. Yeah. You know, And I think that a lot of people feel like that process of really loving and polishing your code is this refactoring step that really makes things clear. Yeah, and and the reason that you have unit tests is so that when you do your refactoring, oh, yeah. you know you haven't broken it. Yeah, when yeah, you yeah. integration tests, you do your refactoring yeah. and do that, stuff like that. Yeah. Um, we uh, will go over this, but basically there, there's whole books written on this stuff. Uh, you know, in this particular case, uh, we have a local, we pull an expression out into a name local variable. Uh, so if this width is greater than light size, warn at begin to big. Uh, so you want to actually have that, uh, you make that into the message at begin to big. So now you have a constant that contains that and you don't have a literal that's in your code. Did this really, I think this might have even come up in our class as well, yeah. where people were saying, uh, make sure that you, if you have any hardwired uh, 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 things in your code, you want to be able to extract Put them. Put it into your globals, yeah. Global statics, yep. 
Oh my. And there's all sorts of stuff there. <laughs> so there is, uh, and we don't really want to spend a lot of time here because you'll just fast forward and skip past us talking about this. Anyway. Well, they. Yeah, probably. Really? So. Should we put a little dance in to see if anybody saw the dance? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that book, yeah. I think that book, I've seen that book on yeah. real software engineer shelves, yeah. uh, Martin Fowler's book, and that's where he refers to bad code spells. Yeah. yeah. Uh, definitely something you should read. Uh, you should look up and just uh, uh, practice, uh, just fixing it. Um, every time I look at my code, I see things that I should have done better the first time, and I try to fix them as I go through. Yeah. Um, I like this. I got to remember to go back and, and refresh my memory of some of these. Yeah. So uh, code spell example one of three, uh, a class has public properties and very few methods. Uh, you know, so why do you have this class? Well, it's actually a struct. In C, it would be a struct. Absolutely. Uh, and so, you know, there's all sorts of suggestions here. Uh, there's one here with duplicated code. Uh, the duplicated code is the warn before return too big. Yeah. Uh, that's the thing that you want to do that. Uh, so you've got, so this if statement is in both places. Uh, when we did the, um, the unit test fix up. There was that one piece of code that never executed because it was a duplicated code. Yeah, and I think they all did very well at yeah. finding that yeah. too. Yeah. Uh, too many parameters. Uh, sometimes. Um, <laughs> sometimes you got to. Yeah. Sometimes you got to. If you if you look at uh, if you take my uh, graphics course, you'll see that the hardware has these function calls with lots of parameters. Systems. Systems as well. Systems. AWS oh, as well. Something yeah. like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so well, let's say that sometimes that's just a, a, something that you have to live with, but in your own code, you can write it without that many. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I personally, I would rather call one function with a whole bunch of parameters and multiple functions. So yeah, you know. yeah. Uh, most common refactoring is renaming uh, your variable. You, you, know, uh, you, you have a variable that says a student, uh, and then later you realize that that student is just a student ID. Oh, uh, yeah. So you just rename it to be student yeah. ID. Because so it's not a full-on yeah. student. Yeah. Um, so, uh, again, number four, people are often afraid to rename things. Unit test, unit test, unit test. Yeah. And use your IDE to do the change. Oh, my gosh. Don't go through and try to do it manually. Yeah. You've got to make sure. And I think there's so many people, I mean, in so many different ways, that this has been a problem. But, yeah, but your IDE can do this. It can handle it. Because remember, the... 35% of your time is you reading someone else's code, and there's someone else in the company who's reading your code. Oh, God. And so you want to make their life as easy as possible so that in return, they make your life as easy as possible. Yeah. There's an interesting word there. <laughs> I find it's often a sign of deeper design malaise. Yeah. <laughs> I'm kind of feeling like that's a... <laughs> that's a that's a sad word. It, it's a, that, yeah. that really, uh, it's just sometimes you are just moving fast. Yeah. And it is that you've got a lot of things, and it makes sense to you at the time, but it's that when you give it a day and you go back, it'll make more sense if you rename it. So all modern IDEs handle refactoring. Right. It's not just Visual Studio Code, all of the uh, IntelliJ, uh, every single modern IDE. If your IDE does not support refactoring, get rid of your IDE. Yo, bad relationship. Walk yeah, away. what IDE would that be? That doesn't work. I don't know. But yeah, yeah. I can, okay, yeah. and so there's a whole bunch of local refactorings, renaming variables, extract methods, inline methods, extract. And a lot of these depend on your language. Uh, some uh, languages support inline functions, uh, callbacks. Uh, we saw, uh, in fact, we saw a, a a a total refactoring of the language with JavaScript when they introduced promises. So that was a total refactoring of the language so that you wouldn't have all those then, 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 then callback. It was that all. cascading yeah. craziness. And because yeah. that was difficult to read, the people that were in charge of JavaScript came up with this idea of we're going to have a promise, which is a container that contains code that will be executed later. And so that refactoring made code better and easier to read. Yeah, and I feel like uh, programming languages evolve um, to make sure that code is easier to read, you yeah. know, and that's a very big thing to be able to say, you know, back in the day, there was callback craziness with all of that, and now this is way better. Why is it better? It's easier to read. Well, there, there was, there's, a, there's a famous language, which we shall not name, uh, that has definitions and implementations in separate files. 
Is it A? No. Is it B? Is it C? You don't have to do that. You, but modern languages don't have that. Yeah, modern yeah. languages have, the, the compiler is smart enough to go read your code and see True. what you're exporting. True. So remember in, in, type, in TypeScript, we have export. Yeah. And that's basically the same functionality as having your definition in and your different. implementation. Yeah. Now, C and C++ continue to be very uh, popular languages, but I don't like having to read a separate file to see what the definition is. Oh, it is isn't nice. It's not nice. Compiler, there's a lot of things compilers can do for us that we don't need to do anymore. Yeah. Um, refactor, um, you know, there's a new feature coming in. Uh, and you know that mm. there, you're, remember, remember when we added um, the error feedback uh, and we had to go refactor the code for calc sheet and That's we had right. to go, we, we added it and then the container. So there's, there's a little bit of refactoring you guys did there. Um, and I think that that uh, a lot of students, again, it was something that people understood what they were doing and it was natural to refactor mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and we heard uh, in the last uh, presentation from assignment three, uh, where you guys found some bugs and fixed them, that was also refactoring. You, you, you know, the, 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 the code that uh, one of the teams added for the, the sign and code, the A sign and the A, uh, A cosine bug that I introduced, they refactored the code such that there was an if statement that said, if this is out of range, then we'll give you an error rather than having the whole thing blow up on you. Yeah. Now, is that technically a refactoring? I mean, you're at, like, because it's not behavior preserving. Uh, it was refactoring in that they added a new error. Yeah. And okay. So, yeah, so, so they, they added a new error. Uh, so they refactored yeah. the error messages. Yeah. And then uh, to, yeah. to deal with something that yeah. hadn't been done before. Yeah. yeah. And something that was that technical then? That, that was the fix sloppiness by programmers. That's what they were doing. <laughs> I, well, I was going to say, was that technical debt in the code? It was definitely technical debt, and we'll get about that. But what is the technical debt? Who do, you, who do you actually owe it to? I don't know. I don't know. Um, when do you refactor? Uh, the whole point of Agile is get something running first yeah. and then get it done. And, and refactoring comes in at different levels. You can refactor a single function. Yeah. You can refactor a class. Uh, and at the last company that I was at, uh, they built a monolithic backend. Oh, yeah. And because that was the fastest way to get into business. I'm all about the monolith. And then clients yeah. and scalability and more teams and different people and big merge conflicts and stuff like that. Yeah. So they refactored their back end into a microservice architecture. When they needed to. When they needed to, not before. Yeah. And that's the whole thing. Over-engineering is, is a is a really dangerous thing to do. Yeah. I really liked uh, when Jeff was talking about even just interviews, he was saying, you know, start off with just, you know, uh, a single server and, you know, you'll be answering questions and maybe you get up to the point where they start talking about distributed systems, but probably the interview's over by then anyway, but that don't do those microservices until you need them. Yeah. Um, Notice that we talk about testing and we talk about testing and we talk about testing. When you're refactoring, make sure you have testing in place before you try refactoring. Yeah, and I feel like, you know, um, if you really get excited about unit tests, and I do now, I didn't before I saw that they could be generated for me so easily, but now I can get excited about them. I feel like I want to refactor in order to make sure that I have better unit tests that are really, I have more units to test, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> Um, uh, refactor is sometimes it can become um, an exercise in polishing an apple that's already shiny. Yeah. So I've got this really shiny thing. I want to make it shinier and shinier and shinier. Yeah. And you're not actually adding any value to the customer. Yeah. So um, it may not be safe. Um, and you may actually, you, you may see this long API yeah. with 23 parameters. You go, I'm going to refactor that into five different calls. And then all of the people that are calling your software, um, it says um, it doesn't work anymore. Yeah. And, that, and that's why AWS has a policy that they never deprecate an old API. Yeah. So they have versioned APIs. Okay. And so you, there are clients that are still using version one of S3. Yeah. No. 
Oh, yeah. really? Yeah. Oh, oh, and I'd love to see the evolution of that API yeah. too. Like that's a really interesting thing to study is how that API. Oh, okay, okay. so what is technical debt? Well, the, the truth is that nobody actually knows. Uh, it's it's a term that's um, that's um, it's used to indicate that we know that there's problems in our software. Yeah. It could be that we. But isn't there always? No, with my software. Okay, there is. I don't know. There is. There is. There is. There is there's the A cause. The but, A side. But it is true that you know, that line between, I know it's not complete because it's not supposed to be. And I know that there's probably some bugs because it's not production quality. Mm -hmm. And someone saying, well, let's put a little line around that. And that's the technical debt. That's where I feel like there's some gray area. Well, um, I, th I think an, an example of something that is fragile in Calc Sheet right now is the transport mechanism of the computed spreadsheet from the document to the document server up to the front end, uh, it was very difficult to add that error message. Oh, okay. Right? Because we didn't have uh, we didn't have uh, that package defined as a first class citizen, mm -hmm. so it was very difficult. We had to kind of go, well, you have to touch it here, you have to touch it here, you have to touch it here. You had to actually edit four files to yep. get that thing to go up there. Yeah. Once you did that, then the second part was really easy. But that's a classic example of we didn't think we were going to have to change that package, but when we did, it was really expensive. Yeah. So maybe it would be worth the time to go and say package.ts is a class yeah. that's going to, and everything writes into that, yeah. but is it worth it? Are we going to make that change again? Yeah. Right. And if that's the only change you're making, maybe you just suck it up and do it that way. But if you know that there's going to be continuous improvements and, and modifications to that communication package, uh, you might want to just uh, yeah. uh, update that. It's a bit of a sign when uh, a change, a single change, kind of uh, has to span a lot of different classes. Right. I think that's sort of a, back in the day, I remember people talking about brittle code. And certainly Mythical Man Month talks about the fact that, oh, all of these unintentional interactions mm -hmm. was really straining the system. So, yeah. but at the same time, that was, if it's a one-shot deal, I yeah. get. Uh, yeah, fixing a bug is not necessarily uh, fixing technical debt. Yeah, right. Right. Yeah. right. And it's not just code. We talked. I talked about my previous company where they had a back end, which is monolithic, and they went to uh, microservices. Microservices are more expensive. Yeah. Uh, they're more dangerous because you got more things to test. Yeah. But it uh, it allows teams to work independently. Yeah. Uh, but it and only scale. works if you, it only works if you have uh, API contracts between the teams. Right. If you don't, then it doesn't work. Yeah. It seems to me like Amazon has that figured out. It was, they're working on it. <laughs> um, basically, um, every time. So the, 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 the fun part about our discipline is that we could rewrite anything at all. At, at any time, we can delete all of our files. We can start from scratch and we can rebuild it. Yeah. You can't do that with a building. You no. can't tear down a building and add another elevator. It's uh, just not right? that it's, practical. It's not that practical. <laughs> but because, so, so there's this kind of... Um, myth that we can rebuild anything at all time, but it costs a lot of money to rebuild software. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, um, but basically, uh, there's a whole uh, there's a whole body of, of literature on, on how to kind of call a technical debt. But basically, technical debt, the way that you should think about it is, it's the thing that is slowing you down from meeting your customer's needs. Okay. Right? Yeah. And yeah. so if adding a new feature, which, so if you have a, fe a new feature that's 100 lines of code, but you have to edit 57 files to make those 100 lines of code work, mm -hmm. maybe you don't have a good architecture. Maybe it's worth rethinking your architecture uh, such that the next feature, you only have to edit one file. Yeah, so you don't keep um, uh, adding this overhead of this technical debt to everything that you're trying to do. Right. It's you're trying to minimize how many times you go through that pain. Got it. Yeah. Um, and so um, they have costs. I mean, uh, code is uh, difficult to read. It's difficult to debug. Uh, there's, you know, sometimes technical debt is there's missing documentation. 
Oh. So it's like, or the documentation's out of date. Uh, there's only one thing that's worse than missing documentation. It's bad documentation. <laughs> yeah. Good point. Yeah. Um, it does, and so there's, you know, there's a whole bunch of people that study, they have all these graphs and it goes up and it gets expensive, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that's true, but it, um, it, it's uh, something that uh, a good company is continuing to invest. Uh, yeah. At uh, when I started a staff base, uh, I found out that uh, most launches were broken because the testing wasn't there. So we spent an entire quarter uh, refactoring our codes so we could do unit tests on them yeah. and, and do that. And we told our PMs, "You're not getting any features this quarter." Uh, uh, they were not right. happy. They were not happy. Does but, it? Um... But it, but our but after that, our launches were more predictable and we, we avoided this idea of, of having to tell our customers on Tuesday and on Wednesday and on Thursday that our code was broken Yeah, because yeah. we were running a serv uh, software as a service. So do you feel like if we're um, really moving fairly quickly, uh, you know, ad adopting agile methodologies as opposed to maybe taking more time to really, you know, think about that architecture for a long time before doing some develop development. Do you feel like that um, speed of agile can sometimes result in uh, sort of a buildup of technical debt because well, uh, you're always trying to do that? Yeah, especially in, in, a, in a startup environment yeah. where you're trying to get these 75 features out to your users really quickly to get those users so you can go to the VC money and say, hey, we got these clients, it's like that. Uh, you have to have a plan for uh, basically build it once, understand how it works, understand how you should build it, yeah. and build it again. Yeah, right? throw that first one yeah. away. Exactly. Yeah. Was what we used to say. Yeah, throw it away. <laughs> uh, and and you could you could say you could actually do things like write your prototype so that it's not scalable. Yeah. So that it forces you to do that. Yeah. Um, uh, that's what I did for Honeycode. I wrote it in La in Python. It was not scalable. Yeah. Uh, but it got us through the demo. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so good reasons to go into technical debt. You want to go fast, you want to get up and running, and you're doing a hackathon. Yeah, Boom, you gotta, get the product oh, out yeah. the door. A lot of people here today yeah. do it, building some technical yes. debt in the building. Some of our people are here. Um, um, you know, uh, sometimes you have to fix a bug. Your oh. system's gone down, and you got to go in there, and you got to put a piece of hard-coded number in your code, mm -hmm. which is exactly what every single professor told you not to do ever. Yeah. But you went in and you put it in there. Yeah. Um, and I, you knew that it was a, uh, it was just waiting to come back and get you one day. <laughs> and even that, you know, that describing that idea of when you have to make a change in multiple places over and over and over again, you can do this refactoring and maybe like that, when are you going to do that if you're really just trying to get things out the door? Yeah. Yeah. And, and this, so that last one, premature optimization is the root of all evil. That will guarantee that you do not get your job. If you start, if you're doing an interview and you start optimizing before you finish writing the code that works, yeah. you're not going to finish writing the code. You will not get your job. So the whole, the, the way that we approach writing software, the way you should do it is get it up and running, yeah. understand how it works, yeah. then build it again. Well, it's a much happier way, yeah. you know, it's kind of, yeah. Um, so here we have kind of a Python, um, uh, the Instagram uh, growing, um, the, so the cost, so the user growth is green, uh, but the cost in servers is orange, uh, <laughs> so you can see that there's a nonlinear relationship between yeah, the two. Yeah. Uh, so they had to fix that because their back end wasn't working. Um, Google has 20% time for tasks such as this. They will say, you know, you can take every Friday and you can work on improving the, you can do whatever you want. So long right. As I, I hear like it's, we'll do whatever you want. I didn't think of it as getting rid of technical debt. Uh, some, yeah. some, I, I, I know it's a good idea. Like, uh, Amazon, it, there is an award for Amazon engineers if they delete more code in one year than they write. Gosh. They get an award. Yeah. Right. And so I've seen it where 
uh, engineer came up and he wrote 45,000 lines of code last year and he got rid of 60,000. Yeah, right. isn't that great? They were all comments. <laughs> <laughs> um, so one of the things that you, you there's all these metrics in software engineering that come up. Oh, agile. they've been under a lot of debate. I don't yeah. know. I, uh, and, and, and I, um, uh, it's, we, we're covering it here so that you know it. Yeah. But they're not useful metrics. I've never seen a team where sprint velocity actually added any value to what they do. But it may be this, that if you join a startup and there are people in there that believe in this, you know, it's okay to try to measure things. It's okay well, to participate in things so, so that are... It is, absolutely. Sure. It, it, you, you embrace the culture. But the thing about our craft is that we're always building something that's never been built before. Yeah. And so estimating, hey, I'm going to build something so I've never built before. I'm going to estimate it. And then you get punished if you misestimate it. Uh, that's why... So um, one of the things you can learn as an engineer, if you think you can do it in three days, say nine days. Oh, multiply it by three. Multiply, I've heard yeah. this. Because yeah. as, a, as a manager, whenever an engineer told me, I can do it in three days out of my head, I would put nine days in there. Yeah. And yeah. so if you're a really smart engineer, if he's already multiplied or she's already multiplied in her head, then, you, then they get 27 it, days. They, yeah, yeah, which would not be a bad thing to suggest. <laughs> uh, lines of code, not the best metric. Uh, because you can unroll your for loops. Yeah. Uh, there's all sorts of things you can do. Uh, bugs open and close. Uh, I had an engineer who worked on one bug for six months, wow. and it involved changing one line of code, and he was a hero because he fixed it. Really it crazy. took him six months. It was deep yeah. inside a game engine yeah. uh, to get that. How do you reward that engineer? Because exactly. he made a huge difference to that code base. Oh yeah, and, I bet. And I think the thing is, yeah, what it, what is the severity of of different bugs? And yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and there's a whole bunch of uh, uh, U.S. Uh, kind of things, but basically there was a whole bunch of uh, how do you measure uh, what's happening? Uh, and you know, the this has all come out of the Vietnam decision making, where they were actually measuring the wrong thing. Um, and so we'll just skip Vietnam. Um, these compl psych cyclomatic complexity numbers, I've heard these before and seen them before and never really, I mean, with students, I think it was, I think this is about like, if you were to draw out the flow chart, how like many, there it is. they're okay. So <laughs> almost <laughs> like I read it. <laughs> I mean, like, so this, uh, you know, and you can, uh, there are ways to collect these yeah. automatically. Oh, yeah. So sure, like if your team is into it, great. Right. But I don't know, I don't know what they're like. I know this is academic. I don't know yeah. what it's like well, in industry. It, it's, it's, um, it, it would be a good thing to add to your build system. Okay. Such that if M becomes like a million. Yeah, yeah. You flag it and say there's some really horrible code in there. Yeah, and it just needs to be refactored. Yeah, it's just it, it's a flag, and someone can look at it and go, yeah, it's it's that's the way it's supposed to be. Yeah. Um, so as you can see, it's a whole big article. Um, so uh, we 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 can um, at one point uh, I was talking to an HR professional, and uh, she said to me, I want to pay our software engineers by lines of code. And I said, absolutely, let's do that. And I would, and I said, I will become a programmer too. Yeah. I will add so many comments to my code that you won't know what hit you. Exactly. Um, well, and like you said, unwrapping, unrolling loops, and you know, yeah, don't motivate the wrong. Yeah, don't so, feed the wrong wall. So basically, here I'll pay ten dollar bonus for every bug you find and fix. I'm going to add ten bugs a day into my code and then find them and fix them. Exactly. There you go. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, the um, root cause analysis is, so whenever you finish a project and you guys have done that, uh, you want to have this conversation about what work, worked and what didn't work. Oh yeah. Now, why did it not work? Uh, why weren't we talking to each other? Well, we set up the stand up for six in the morning. I felt and like that's our, not a good thing. I felt like our teams the other night did a beautiful job of reflecting on yeah. what worked and didn't work for them and, and, and how, you know, what, what lessons were learned, how they rejigged the team dyna dynamics based on that. I would say that I learned a lot from listening mm -hmm. to our students about how they yep. did that. It was very nice. Oh, the rock star yeah. of the ninja. So, so, so both of these are, are meaningless terms. <laughs> 
Uh, rock stars are people who learn to play a guitar at a particular time in history, <laughs> and people like their music. Doesn't necessarily mean that they were good. In fact, most of the musicians I like are not good at all. Metallica, <laughs> Black Sabbath, they're not that good. But they're fine. They're they're but fun. they, but they, and they remind you of times that yeah, you had a very yeah. good time. Yeah. The. Um, and uh, maybe on that note. I, you know, it's hard to give feedback to team members that um, uh, want to carry the whole load. You know what I mean? I think, um, you know, that person that kind of goes, I can get this done. Well, yeah, if you if you work alone, you can get a lot of things done very quickly. I My sense is that when I've seen teams in uh, students doing that, that there there really are more problems with that, that model than it fixes. Mm -hmm. And... I'm wondering if in industry there's kind of that it's but it's hard to give feedback to that person because you you know you don't want to there's nothing wrong that they love to do it all it's more like can you also see that your team will be stronger if you could make sure that well, you don't do everything and well say I, I, I had a I had a person working for me who was working about 90 hours a week uh, and they were not delegating yeah. And the conversation we had with this person was, you are doing, first, there, you're, two things. One is you're cheating yourself. You're working two jobs worth. You're only getting paid for one. one. Yeah. So that, that's it. And the other one is that you're setting expectations for people who want to work 40 hours a week that are unmaintainable. Oh, yeah. Right? And, and this person was managing three other people, and they were very frustrated because they couldn't produce the same amount of output as this person. And that person but, was probably frustrated with them. Oh, yeah, of course. So eventually yeah. we had to get rid of that person because they refused to work less hours. Yeah. That was, uh, it was, uh, yeah, but it really was that, that, that feedback that we had to give that. Uh, so here we go. Uh, uh, HRT. Um, what does HRT stand for? Um, <laughs> That's a very good it's, question. It's, uh, I think, well, for it, it, the idea here is I believe that we're going to go in here and we're going to talk about. Um, how to talk to how people, to talk to people. In, a, in a code review. SBI. So, so basically. It is. Yeah. It is. Yeah. So, so don't be personal. Man, you totally got the control flow wrong. Uh, wrong is very judgmental. You should be using that's kind of very strong words. And then you're comparing it to someone else. Uh, there's a much better way of saying that. Um, I'm confused by the control flow in this section here. I wonder if the FUBAR code pattern uh, might make this clearer to it easier to maintain. So yeah. it's kind of a collaborative coming along beside the person and talking to them. It, and and it's hard because, you know, I mean, the more you get to know people, uh, the easier, like, but really, the exchanges can be really canned by oh, yeah. the time you get to know people. And that's fine. But there is, for everybody around you, too, you got to recognize that other people are hearing these exchanges as well. And uh, when you're speaking in a way that uh, uh, reflects uh, maybe some disrespect or something, even if it's between good friends, right. um, that actually can have an impact on other people mm -hmm. where they're made to feel uncomfortable. Yep. And I've seen that play out in ways that I did not anticipate. And I sort of thought, wow, okay, I learned a really good lesson. You just got to always keep it positive, about you know uh, trying to make sure that collaboration is is working well and that feedback is actually being incorporated that it's not just kind of falling deftly on the floor. Correct. Oh, the bus factor! What a great bus! I yeah, know. how many? So that whole rock star thing of that one person carrying the whole yeah. team. But we we don't very use, deadly. We don't use the, uh, the the term "got run over by a bus" anymore. No, we don't. We use "you won the lottery." Uh, oh, uh, you won the oh, lottery. That's... And you left. It's a way. It's a positive. Why did the person leave? They won the lottery. Okay, they're not. <laughs> so it used to be that we used to say the bus factor. Like, what happens if you get run over by a bus? Which is a very morbid way of saying. Yeah. Are, how important are you to? You know, what if you leave the team? Uh, now we like to think of what if you got a huge bonus or what if you won the lottery? That's nice that that evolved. I didn't know that that would evolve. I like that. Um, so failures are inevitable. Um, at at, uh, at uh, Amazon, we have uh, this thing called the cause of error um, document. Oh, okay. And w the number one rule of the cause of error document is that no names yep. are mentioned. 
Yep. The operator. Yep. Did this. The operator did this. The operator was trying to do this. Yep. And in order to stop this, we're going to put these new safeguards in there. Yeah. And yeah. that's a post mortem. And, that and uh, you know, isn't there, personal. Yeah. There was that uh, one place where uh, an engineer on S3 was trying to shut down some hosts, and he had asterisk dot something, but there was a space between the asterisk and the dot, and he shut down oh, about 10,000 hosts instead of 10. Uh, and so what they did was they introduced a, a check that if you're trying to shut down hosts and the number was greater than 10, it would ask you, you're you sure? about to shut down. Are you sure you mean to do this? <laughs> you're about to shut down the internet. Are you sure yeah. you want to do that? Back in the day, it used to be, uh, you're about to shut down your operating system. Are you sure you want to do that? <laughs> so, and this is common practice in uh, Google, Amazon, Facebook. Uh, they all have this process for uh, uh, postmortems. Uh, they should be called postpartums because if something got born. Yeah. Postmortem means something died. Died. Uh, but well, and, and died, it, it's a postmortem because something went wrong. Is that what it is? Well, no. Postmortems are done at the end of every project. Not uh, necessarily that. Okay. Um, and so basically. Um, Every team does it differently and yeah. at, at every stage in the team. Uh, you know, the first sprint, there's a whole bunch of things that went wrong. The second sprint, you fix some things. And then after about 10 or 20 sprints, your postmortems are going to be like, hey, OK, or your retrospectives, as we call them in okay. Agile. Uh, yeah. Things are going well. And, and, and you don't always have to find something wrong to fix. Things can actually be working OK. Wow, what a nice yeah. outcome. <laughs> and with that. Thank you for spending time with us for this class. It's been a blast for us. This it's is over. A, it's over. It's over. So we, you should have a, you and I should have a postmortem. Okay, we'll do it. Uh, and uh, with them too, for yeah. sure. Please feel free to give us feedback on Trace, but yeah. also it would be great uh, to yeah, hear we, from we, everybody. We, we will add a, a zero point quiz. Uh, yeah, that, yeah. where you guys can just tell us what you thought of the course, what worked, what didn't work. Yeah. Uh, if you feel comfortable, that's great. We like we like being able to see the face behind the comments. Uh, if you don't feel comfortable giving feedback there, that's what Trace is for. Uh, there's all sorts of other feedback mechanisms, but uh, yeah. I, I believe we'll get a lot of uh, open conversation with these students. I they, think they've been so. Great so far. They've been really great, and I just feel like you and I are going to have to keep making videos, even though no one's going to watch them. Okay, cool. <laughs> All right. All right. Stop sharing here. All right. And then Sorry we'll, that uh, I think. Share. Uh, recording has stopped. Perfect. I think. Um, sure. Are you okay for your. You got to go in three minutes. Are you okay? Okay. It's going to stop recording. Okay. All it, right. It takes a while for that.